Welcome, folks. Yay, so good to have you here. Also, so great to see so many of you here. Um, welcome to tonight's talk, which is fermentation, how cultures shape culture. And the first time I saw that line, I was like, what a great line, whoever came, whoever came up with that. Um, I have been looking forward to tonight for ages because I myself, as Joe alluded to, I'm on my fermentation journey. I like to dabble. Uh, I really enjoy it. And to have like these experts and aficionados all in one room together that I get to ask questions to is great. I'm so excited and I have been for ages and delighted I was asked to do it. So thank you. Um, as Joe said, my name is Leila Kazim and we've got a pretty amazing all-star panel of fermentation I'm going to say the word again, aficionados. And so let me introduce them to you. I'm going to start over here. We have got James Reed. I love this. Who is on a mission to smuggle bacteria back into our kitchens. <laughs> like contraband. He is the author of the very beautiful Cabbages of Cabbages and Kimchi, founder of Kim Kong kimchi and it's also chief trading officer at the fermenters guild please give a warm welcome to james we have got the wonderful Alyssa timoshkina who is a london-based food writer and historian specializing in eastern european food culture she has an equally beautiful book called Salt and Time, Recipes from a Russian Kitchen. Please give a very warm welcome to Alyssa. <laughs> Sam, I'm going to come to you last, even though you're actually next in line. So I'm going to go to Kenji. We have got Kenji Morimoto, who is a fourth generation Japanese-American based in London, whose cultural identity is grounded in food and he explores the global diasporic traditions through the lens of his Instagram, which is a great account, by the way. Everyone should check it out. In fact, everyone's accounts are great. And Kenji is working on his first book. Give a warm welcome to Kenji. And joining us remotely is the wonderful Sandor Alex Katz. He is a fermentation revivalist and author. His books include Wild Fermentation, The Art of Fermentation, Fermentation as Metaphor, and his latest is Fermentation Journeys. Sandal's books, along with the hundreds of fermentation workshops he has taught around the world, have helped to and uh, I'm catalyze, I've got some liquid on my words here, a broad revival of the fermentation arts. And Sandor, I would like to personally thank you because it is your bright pink wild fermentation book that got me onto my firm. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> that got me onto my fermentation journey. And the first thing I fermented was some sort of veg thing from your book. And I've since made wine and doses and kefir. And so you are fully responsible for me being on this journey. So that's just a personal thank you to you. Warm welcome to Sandor. Thank you. So the format of today is we are going to be discussing between us the cultural origins and the importance of fermentation. And then we are going to open up to the audience to ask questions. So do think of some throughout the evening and save them to the end. And then there are going to be some tastings. And I don't know, if, but when you came up those stairs, you could probably smell the fact that there are going to be tastings later on. These guys have been portioning up some very delicious things. Um, so do, you've got to stay around for this. I think it's worth the ticket price alone, to be honest. Kenji, what did you bring today, please? Sure. So for tonight, I made um, sambaizuke, which is a play on a traditional Japanese and Hawaiian-American pickle. So essentially, um, traditionally using daikon, cucumber, carrot. But here, I've adapted to use fennel, um, as well as additional aromatics, star anise, ginger, and essentially a soy, apple cider vinegar, um, sake, 
brine. Um, so again, a kind of an acidic vinegar-based pickle. So no fermentation in that. However, there are fermented products that are driving the flavor. Amazing. Sounds incredible. And James? Uh, I've got two things uh, for you to try tonight. I've brought some uh, beichu kimchi, so um, some Chinese leaf. Uh, carrot, ginger, spring onion um, kind of kimchi, and also uh, some bottles of tapache, uh, which is a fermented but low to no alcohol um, Mexican pineapple drink, which is very exciting because it's kind of no waste because it only uses the parts of pineapple you'd otherwise throw away, the skin and the core. Very excited for you to try that if it hasn't exploded in the green room <laughs> while we're having a chat. There's a real risk of that. Um, wonderful, can't wait for that. How I would like to begin is with a little bit of audience participation, because I think it would be really nice for us and for everyone here to, to kind of gauge where people, what kind of relationship the people in the audience have with fermentation, if any at all. So please raise your hands if you would classify yourself as a fermentation nut. You ferment everything under the sun, you're fermenting all the time, you would ferment your cat if you could get away with it. You absolutely love fermenting. There, I like how there is a high density of these people in that particular row there. Down here, we've got some over here, we've got some here. Excellent. Second show of hands. If you fall into a medium group, you have fermented in the past. Actually, you ferment quite regularly. You've uh, tried a lot of different things, but there's loads you haven't tried. There's loads you don't know. There's uh, just, you're here with open minds and eyes to learn loads. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> so this is interesting. We've got most people have fermented something before. And then final group, if you have barely brined a thing in your life and you are totally new to this whole world, maybe you've maybe done one thing before, but, but really you're here to sort of find out more and uh, see what the hell this fermentation funky stuff is all about. Mm. Yes, yeah, so oh wow, this is so good. Because I thought it'd be a good uh, mm. sort of idea of who we've got in the audience. Okay, this is fabulous. I fall into the second group. Um, right, so question, I should probably get onto that. Wow, time goes quick. Um, okay, so my first question to the panel is, of course, fermentation is a, is a process of preservation that has been around for millennia. However, I don't know about you guys, I don't know about you guys, but it feels to me that it is only in recent times, in recent years, where the interest in it seems to have just shot up. I mean, the people here, testament to that, because the tickets to this particular talk sold out so quickly that it was actually moved to this bigger space and then more tickets were put on. So it's a really popular to topic. Even my younger brother is into fermentation now. For his birthday, I gave him some dehydrated milk kefir grains and two glass jars, and I don't think anyone has ever received a better present in their life, <laughs> to be honest. Um, so my question is, fermentation feels like it's riding a swelling wave that is yet to break. Is fermentation having a moment? And if so, why now? And I'm gonna start over with James. So, I mean, yeah, as, as you allude to, it's something that's been around for, well, we as humans have been fermenting for at least 8,000 years that we've got archaeological uh, kind of evidence of. So I would say that like 2023 in the kind of the lifespan of fermentation is like the wrinkle in like a lactobacilli's eyelash. Um, <laughs> So it's, it, it, it is having a moment, but I think it's, it's on, a, on a long trajectory. But yeah, I also thought that kind of we'd reached peak kimchi in the UK when I started my kimchi company in 2016. And thankfully, I was just wildly naive about that. Uh, and we had a long way to go. But I think probably the reason why it's kind of seeing so much popularity at the moment is kind of threefold. There's um, definitely kind of the ecological kind of aspect in terms of uh, people are much more aware of what they eat, where it comes from, and therefore I think being able to find alternative ways of preserving food that are less fridge reliant and that can keep food uh, lasting further out of season, I think that's a big thing. And kind of tying into that also like the cost of all the ingredients that we buy and that we eat with has just done that. So being able to like buy up lots of ingredients when they are available and kind of make them more uh, kind of last further out of season, that's also a big thing. 
And then obviously there is a big thing to do with the health benefit. We're discovering more and more every day, every month, every year about uh, the effects, uh, the positive effects of fermentation on the microbiome. But it is such a kind of new and exciting nascent topic that you know I generally avoid talking about the health benefits of fermentation because I think by the time the kind of words are out of my mouth, there'll be more information. But I think that's kind of like the triple threat of fermented foods right now. Mm. Alyssa. Well, I have to thank that wave for actually encouraging me to write my cookbook um, because um, I've been asked a few times you know, whether or not I was toying with the idea of writing a book around 2016 as well. And I really couldn't find kind of the connecting point between what I do and what sort of the British food scene would like to read. Um, and fermentation was that because suddenly it just felt like words that I knew since I was a child, you know, kefir is something that I drank as a kid, uh, sauerkraut that was suddenly everywhere and considered like super trendy, but you only get like a tiny little bit to try somewhere in a healthy <laughs> shop. It's like, what? what is going on? <laughs> um, and that was precisely what inspired Salt and Time, and actually Salt and Time itself is a reference to that magic mm. of fermentation and that kind of our chemistry that happens in the jar where you cook with nothing but salt and thyme. And then kind of through that, I opened up um, a door to Eastern European cuisine, because of course, in Eastern European cooking, uh, ferments are not just there to kind of taste a little bit and give you some gut good gut bacteria, but it's actually a really essential cooking element. Mm -hmm. And you make, you know, there are recipes that feature ferments as a key ingredient. So it's not just about preserving food, but it's also knowing how to then create a really flavorful dish out of a, sour, a simple jar of sauerkraut. How great is it that we have, we have cookbooks that are basically on fermentation? I think it's fab. Sandor, yourself, why, why is fermentation having a moment? Oh. Well, we, we, we have a little bit of a lag, which is making this a little bit hard, but um, I, I believe that fermentation is something that is having a moment. Um, uh, um, you know, there's increased interest in fermentation, but if we think about the products of fermentation, they just have enjoyed enduring popularity. And I think in the, you know, in the food of the UK, if we think about bread, if we think about cheese, if we think about um, ale and beer, if we think about vinegar, you know, we can't even think about the traditional, uh, um, uh, you know, cuisine of the UK without fermentation. And I think that that's just true everywhere. Now, if people for a few decades because of um, you know supermarkets and convenience eating stop thinking about fermentation well they're starting to think about it and I, and I think that you know that the reason why they're trying to start to think about it is because of awareness of bacteria so you know basically after you know once we knew the word bacteria uh, which is only the very end of the 19th beginning of the 20th century we began to associate it with danger and disease and um, so even though we kept eating products of fermentation, we stopped thinking about them. And we you know, figured they were things that had to happen in laboratories and factories somewhere. And um, you know, I think with the Human Microbiome Project and the recognition that bacteria are so important to our health, these bacterially rich foods have become important. And you know, my first book came out in 2003. And um, you know, this book sold better each year than the year before for the first 10 years that it was published. And then around 2011, I started seeing fermentation on these lists of um, you know, the, the top new food trends. And you know, to, for someone to think that in 2011 or in 2023, fermentation was a, a, a new food trend is a, like a little bit, a little bit blind um, um, because you know, fermentation has been so integral to culinary traditions in every part of the world, including the UK. Hmm. And Kenji? Um, cool. So I guess two points to add. So I think one is, I think the pandemic really accelerated interest. Um, I think, you know, we all saw sourdough, right? Everyone is into sourdough. Uh, but not oh, banana just bread. <laughs> exactly, and banana bread. Um, but I think, you know, people really, you know, people were really questioning life, what they were doing, as well as, you know, the actions going into what you're producing, right? So what James was saying about, you know, really more intentional cooking. Um, and I think, and one thing when I teach workshops, there's, I always talk about the mental health or like the wellness element of it. 
you know, something incredibly catharsis about cathartic about you know actually observing what's happening, letting time do its thing. You know, what's out of your control is out of your control, and I think that really resonates with people nowadays, right? Especially post pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I think the other reason, or the other point I want to add is, I think. Um, you know, as everyone's alluding to, fermentation has been around forever, right? But I think for that reason, it's still not unknown, but I think that's the unknown territory of kind of the future of cuisine, right? You see any chef show, you know, any cookbook, um, and oftentimes fermentation is, is a focus of it. What's unique? What is the un uncharted territory? And I think not just in what's been done in respective cultures, but connecting the dots. Right, like you know, bringing Japanese traditions to new new ingredients, for example, in the in the case of koji, right? And I think that's what's really exciting and interesting. So I think that's really driving innovation as well, um, in terms of again not just honoring the traditions or what's quote unquote authentic, but kind of connecting and bringing together different ways of doing things for something entirely new. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's another reason why it's incredibly exciting. And now is I mean, social media, it's so easy to see what's being done and spinning it in your own way. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I love about this panel is that collectively you've experienced fermentation traditions from so many different places, be, be it part of your heritage or your travels or both. And what I want to ask is how important is, is the act and the art of fermentation in the context of a food culture, does it form part of the identity of a food culture? And I think, Kenji, I'll start this side. Sure, of course. So 100%. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been very fortunate in that I've been able to live in a lot of different places. And I grew up in Chicago, so a fairly diverse place. And whenever I meet new people, I often ask them, you know, what are some of your earliest food memories? Right, you know, what are those tastes that remind you of grandparents of growing up? And more often than not, they're usually pickled or fermented ingredients, right? Uh, fermented black beans for my Chinese American friends or, um, you know, d um, you know, dill pickles for my Jewish American friends back home. And I think there's something really interesting that so many of those triggers are from something sour, something umami based, something that's pretty unique to that, to that culture. So I do think it's, it's very universal, as we've all been saying. Um, as Layla said, or yeah, I'm Japanese, I'm Japanese American. Um, and within Japan, I'm sure you guys all know, ferment, fermented ingredients are a massive part of Japanese cuisine, right? And actually, if you research Japanese food, there's something called the Sashi Suseso of Japanese cooking, which essentially is a play on five of the letters of the alphabet. Two of them stand for salt and sugar. The other three are fermented ingredients. So soy sauce, su, which is rice vinegar, and lastly, miso. So it's clearly a fundamental element of the, or essentially the pillars of Japanese food. But I think moving beyond that and kind of looking at my own family history, which again has been one of immigration and displacement, um, what I really like to see is, or what I've really liked, what I've enjoyed witnessing is how that food, particularly through fermentation, has evolved. So when my great grandparents left Hiroshima in the 1880s to adapting their food to sugar plantations in Hawaii, to then moving to California and their children, my grandparents, trying to recreate those senses of home through food. Then obviously the camps and World War II happened, so my grandparents lived throughout the US in internment camps for a few years, and then resettled back in Chicago, which is where I was born. And throughout all those periods, I feel, you know, food and flavor and that search for that, in my mind, that drives culture, right? In terms of how you preserve it, how you think about food, what memories of food you collectively have. And kind of seeing how my family have adapted their recipes, not just the recipes, but actually fermentation again. Um, you know, it has been really fascinating, again, adapting it based on location, on, on locality. And the last anecdote I'll share here is um, so, my, so my maternal grandfather, growing up, my mom, or my mother, my mom told me that growing up, my grandfather used to make um, nukazuke, which is a type of Japanese fermented pickle, essentially creating a fermentation bed out of rice bran, so the byproduct of making rice. However, my grandfather in the 1950s, 60s in Chicago couldn't find that, so he used uh, quick oats, like Quaker oats. Um, and essentially, you can, you can use the same exact method, the same exact um, you know, logic, science, a different ingredient, and you still create similar flavors of home. Right? So I think it's been so cool just not to see, obviously, Japanese food being Japanese food and being great, and how fermentation is a fundamental part of it, but how that's evolved and adapted throughout, again, not just generations, but location mm -hmm. and memory. Um, and that, I find that really cool. And I, so, so yes, a massive part of identity and food culture. I love that that's such a great um, anecdote, as you say, of t taking, uh, taking a, 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 tra a thread of a tradition that has been around for ages and reinterpreting it 
in a new place with what is available and being able to keep that 100%. Going. And, you know, is that authentic? I would say yes, you know, because again, it's honoring the traditions. It's kind of adapting based on what you have access to. Um, yeah, so I think that's kind of the evolving way to look at it. Sandor. Well, I mean, fermentation is so um, central to so many culinary traditions. And I mean, you know, certainly, you know, the, the, Japanese uh, um, cuisine would be one in which, you know, fermentation is, you know, extremely, extremely important, but, but it's, it's just important everywhere. And, you know, my thinking about why fermentation, um, you know, developed everywhere, you know, is the simple reality that we now can recognize, thanks to the science of microbiology, that, you know, everything we eat, all of the plants and all of the animal products that make up our food, we now understand that they're all populated by these elaborate communities of microorganisms. So there's a certain inevitability to microbial transformation of our food, and you know, not every microbial transformation of food results in something delicious that we're ready to put into our mouths. But you know, our clever ancestors in every part of the world, you know, learned by observation and trial and error under what conditions would food decompose into a disgusting, ugly mess that nobody would ever put into their mouths, and under what other conditions would the food be elevated in some way? There's always a practical benefit to fermentation, whether it's uh, you know, preservation, whether it's digestibility, whether it's producing alcohol, whether it's sheer deliciousness, uh, whether it's removing some um, toxic compound. I actually recently was teaching in Brazil and, um, you know, a food that, that's, um, uh, you know, really comes from the Amazon that's really important in, in Brazilian cuisine and in a lot of different parts of the world is cassava. And, um, you know, I mean, cassava um, uh, uh, can be quite toxic. And, um, you know, the, the, the sort of underlying reason why fermentation is so important with, with, with a cassava, and it can make it more delicious and lots of things, but it breaks down these uh, toxic cyanide compounds in the tubers and just makes something that could be very dangerous to eat, safe to eat. Um, so, you know, in, in different places, with different foods, it's driven by different imperatives. But the reality is that, you know, microbes will transform our food one way or another, and we might as well guide them into ways that are, um, uh, uh, um, that, that are desirable. And, um, you know, in culinary traditions all around the world, this has become deeply embedded in culture and in cultural identity. Mm. On that note of toxic things, I, um, I make wine occasionally. And the first, the first one I tried was, was elderberry. And I was like, you can't eat elderberries raw because you will have a really bad stomach. And I'm not cooking these before I make the wine. And I Googled so much. I was like, do I have to do anything to the elderberries before I ferment them for months? And I couldn't find an answer. No one had really acknowledged it. And I was like, am I going to die if I drink the wine? But the wine is fine. And it's because the process broke down the toxins, which I thought was so cool. It just happened with time over time. Um, Alyssa, if you remember what the question was. Uh, maybe, <laughs> but yes. <laughs> um, in Eastern European culture, fermentation is an absolute building block of people's identities. And of course, food memories form such a huge part of who we are. And um, to me, you know, it's kind of trying to narrow down what would define the tastes and flavors of my childhood. And it's definitely that amazing tang that you get from fermented foods. And there is an opinion that Eastern European food is very simple and humble. You know, some people would even call it boring, which I <laughs> strongly disagree with. But it's definitely a very humble cuisine um, for various reasons, mostly kind of the very complex and fascinating political history of that region. Um, but what makes it so amazing, to me at least, is precisely that the addition of a fermented element to whichever dish you're making, especially if we think about soups, um, it just, as Sandra said, it elevates the flavor to this absolutely mind-blowing complexity and you almost can't put your finger on like what tastes, what does it make uh, this soup taste so good. It only has, you know, sauerkraut, potatoes and mushrooms, for example, but 
you can't stop eating it. And that kind of mystical beauty of it is really something that um, I feel very proud to be part of that uh, culture and uh, something that I kind of carry over to, to my family. Um, and another thing, of course, is, um, as it was mentioned in the introduction, that fermentation is a trend here, partly kind of started by this whole idea of, you know, gut health and clean eating and things that we have now kind of come to realize are not particularly helpful lenses to approach food through. But um, in many cultures, fermentation is a question of survival. And again, when it comes to Eastern European context, um, climate plays a huge part. And it literally, if it wasn't for our ability to ferment food, to preserve it for winter, survival would have been a lot more difficult and the ability to get enough nutrients over the colder months, um, but also the political turmoils that um, Eastern European region has been the stage for and sadly still continues to be. Um, you know, the role of that preserved um, jar of preserved food is literally life saving. I mean, recently, um, or last year, I um, came across a post of a friend of mine who was reposting a picture that was sent to them from. Kharkiv uh, in Ukraine uh, from a cellar where people were hiding from the shelling. Um, and all you could see were mattresses on the floor. And then there was a whole wall of jars of ferment. And to me, that was such an incredible, powerful moment because I could literally viscerally feel what those jars taste like. And that really brought me so close to those people, even though I've never met them. And I hope they're well and alive now. But that kind of really anchored that knowledge and that understanding of just how essential fermentation is to Eastern European life and culture and history. Mm. I also love the term magical beauty that you gave to this incredible magical process. Um, James. Yeah, so I would say um, looking across all, all food cultures and all food ways, when you look at fermentation and what and, and the way it's used in so many food cultures is it's used as kind of a pedestal for some of the most important ingredients that uh, exist within that culture. Um, the things that you choose to ferment, and I say choose in a kind of evolutionary way, like you don't choose, but your society kind of collectively chooses to ferment are the things that uh, grow best in your climate, that uh, are that you have the largest amount of because you've cho chosen to plant that much of that crop, and the things that you want to be able to enjoy, or you more than want need to be able to enjoy year round. So whether that be cabbage in, say, uh, Germany or Eastern Europe that's going to be changed to sauerkraut, or whether it's soybean uh, to be changed into soy sauce, which again, uh, speaking of toxicity, again, something that you can't eat raw. And I remember having the same kind of pattern going, can you eat these? <laughs> They're not cooked. Can you eat them? Oh, no. OK, fermenting. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Although you do also, you do also cook soybeans for that. But yes, it uh, again prevents the toxicity. Um, so I think it kind of really speaks to what a culture has kind of collectively chosen to value are the things that it ferments. And then by fermenting them, you end up having that ingredient kind of ever plenty within your food culture. So it becomes even more important. So. Um, yeah, something like, say, fish sauce in uh, Thailand and Southeast Asia becomes more important because it is just plentiful outside of when you're able to get the catch of the fish that you need to create that. Um, so it's kind of a, a self-fulfilling kind of thing of like importance within food culture. What you ferment is important and will become more important through it. And also then through migration, it's often the things that, that, that societies and food cultures choose to take with them because it is portable and particularly with, with uh, ferments that require it, you can take a really small amount of something and you might have the mother of that and then you can create exactly the same thing that you might have had across uh, a couple of borders in your new home. Um, so yeah, absolutely. It, it is integral and it becomes only more so through fermentation, I think. And so we've talked about uh, the kind of increasing popularity of the, the topic of fermentation. And you guys have also alluded to the fact that we're kind of seeing it market, mar I mean, I'm noticing it marketed to me everywhere now, you know, this product that is live and it will help your gut bacteria and it's good for your microbiome and all of these things that are everywhere in the shops. So my question is, what do you think are the impacts of this commercialization of fermented foods is? Is it a good thing 
or does it pose problems? Uh, Sandor has raised his hand, so I'm going to start <laughs> with Sandor. <laughs> hey, I was coming to you anyway, so that was quite handy. <laughs> I mean, I just don't think that it's a new process. I mean, it might be pr true with these sort of like, you know, non regional foods that are being introduced. But, you know, I mean, there's a long tradition um, of commercialization of bread, of commercialization of cheese, of commercialization of beer, of commercialization of wine. I mean, it's just not, re it's not a reality that, you know, everybody is going to make everything for themselves. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, economics is built on small scale exchange. And, um, you know, in a, in, a, in, in a village, you know, where, where one person's making the sauerkraut, one person's making the cheese, and people are, are exchanging. And, and so, I mean, I don't think that commercialization in and of itself is a negative thing. You know, I mean, certainly all of my books have been about, you know, how to ferment things at home and encouraging people to do that and certainly encouraging people not to be intimidated by that. But, um, you know, I'm thrilled. The first time I taught fermentation in the UK was maybe 2006. And, you know, I couldn't find any commercial uh, non-pasteurized sauerkraut available in the UK, um, you know, uh, 17 years ago or whatever that was. And, and, you know, now it's easy to find everywhere. And I'm, you know, I'm glad people are producing it commercially because, you know, the reality is most people won't make it for themselves. Now, you know, there's production and then there's mass production, and I think that things can be produced at, at, at every different scale. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm all for, de uh, you know, devolving production, small, like scaling down production, having more, um, uh, you know, small scale, regional, localized production. And I think that products of fermentation really lend themselves to that and get much higher quality products generally from um, more limited scale producers. But, you know, commercialization, of, you know, of, of fermentation like any other food product is, you know, more or less inevitable. Alyssa, I'm going to come to you next. Well, I think as with anything commercialized, it always has a bit of a negative tinge to it. Um, I mean, on the one hand, as someone who um, came to the UK from another, a very different cultural context, uh, 24 years ago now, um, and I would have loved to have had the kind of array of fermented stuff that we can get in m and and any kind of you know mainstream supermarkets back then. So I think it obviously is a very massive kind of point of connection and nostalgia for people who are not local. So, you know, and of course, um, there are lots of communities like that. So in that sense, it's a great thing. But at the same time, of course, the more commercial stuff gets, the more removed it becomes from its origin and people lose touch with the history, the culture, the context from which that product comes. And they kind of, you know, miss out on such a fascinating story behind that product. And, and you know, that's kind of the balance between really embracing the multicultural environment that we live in and really embracing the different diasporas and kind of catering towards their uh, food memories and their food nostalgia, but at the same time doing it respectfully in a way that that is still honored and people who buy a kefir from m and these days, um, they actually understand what it is and not just say, oh, that's interesting, that's new, and then kind of forget about it. Hopefully that kind of invites people to want to learn a bit more about where that product comes from and learn about the community where that product was born. Mm. I think that's a really good point. Kenji? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I agree with a lot of that. I mean, I think generally, I mean, I think there's room for all of that, right? I think, you know, there's obviously there's a lot more products on the shelves. I think that's just increasing awareness of these products, right? And people will come to it for a host of reasons. And I think regardless if it's for, you know, eating clean or, your, or, or you know, your gut health or just wanting to do something different and try new flavors, I think that's all good. But I think ultimately kind of what, what you were just saying, you know, it's about honoring those traditions. But also I do think sometimes it is maybe the responsibility, but, you know, for these companies to educate as well, right? So it's not just, you know, commercializing it, making money off of it, but then also, you know, honoring the traditions, but also educating, you know, so, you know, this is the process. If you want to do it, here's how you can do it as well, right? Because I do think that's kind of, that's the beauty of fermentation, right? That it, anyone can literally do it. Um, so, yeah, but I don't think it's a bad thing. Yeah. James? Okay, well, 
as the commercial producer of <laughs> fermented foods, obviously my answer is yes, it's bad. Um, <laughs> and, and, and my reasoning for that is twofold. Um, firstly, um, a lot of fermented food that you can buy is often pasteurized. So if anyone's not familiar with pasteurization, it is the uh, fermented foods are living foods, and pasteurization is the quick heat treatment in order to kill off the living microbes in that food. Um, now, there are a lot of reasons why you might pasteurize uh, fermented foods. Uh, it makes them more shelf stable, which means you can keep them for much longer, which means you can have two year shelf lives. It means that you don't have jars that explode in stores and you don't you know, have somebody calling the humble uh, kimchi maker going, hey, <laughs> my customer's really angry that you've ruined their white shirt, what's going on? Um, and uh, it means that you potentially might not have to even refrigerate them, which is brilliant because cold chain is really expensive. So there's lots of reasons why you might pasteurize fermented foods. Um, and uh, obviously though, pasteurizing fermented foods makes them far less kind of dynamic, far less interesting. It certainly removes any potential uh, gut benefit from it being uh, a living food. Um, so I would say that friends do not let friends pasteurize their <laughs> ferments. Um, but you can find um, unpasteurized fermented foods, of course, but they tend to be made by smaller producers because smaller producers tend to be less concerned about international shipping. They tend to be less concerned about being able to have like two year shelf lives. But consequentially, they also make ferments that tend to be more expensive, which means that if you're looking kind of at the shelf and you're kind of blinded as we often are by the wild array of selection of any product nowadays, and you're like, which one should I buy? Oh, that one's half the price. And I'm not really that familiar with sauerkraut, so I'll buy that one that's half the price and I'll see if I like it. And then you get it home. And you try it and you're like, this isn't very good. And you think sauerkraut's not very good. But the reason is because the, the one that you bought that's cheap, and I'm not against you know, like spending within your budget, but often it means that it's a pasteurized version, but which is actually a really, really different thing. Um, so what's the solution to that? Obviously, just make it yourself. Um, <laughs> but understandably, uh, and because you know, my marketing manager, who's also me, would kill me. Um, <laughs> That's not an option for everyone. Sometimes you might not have the time. You might not uh, have. You might not just want to make fermented foods. So in that case, yeah, of course, buy them, buy a commercial version. But I would look for things that are marked as unpasteurized or raw or living or yeah, those other kind of indicators. Yes. And all buy James's kimchi. Well. And all buy my kimchi if you're going to buy. If you're forced at gunpoint to buy a kimchi instead of just making it yourself, um, <laughs> buy mine. Well, on the note of sort of um, fermenting at home for yourself, I feel like in today's world, when we are increasingly disconnected from where our food comes from, I feel like there, there are like small acts that we can do at home which helps us sort of regain control about the food that we eat, what's in it, how it's processed, where it's come from. These small acts include things like cooking from scratch or growing a few radishes for yourself or fermenting I, I see as part of this act and my question is do you think that these acts fermented fermenting included have the potential to make some kind of statement and if so what kind of statement are they making does anyone want to start I can start um yeah, I think so. And I think for me, a lot of my fermentation journey really started over the pandemic. I had a lot of time on my hands. I was always really into it, but I really wanted to dive headfirst into it. Um, and during that time, obviously, you know, peop, you know, everything was going a bit crazy. So for me, the act of going through fermentation, kind of what I said in my first um, bit, um, was really grounding, right? Um, so I, I was really a Buddhist. I, I am Buddhist, but. And I, throughout most of my life, I wouldn't ever say that I felt like a Buddhist. But it was really through those acts of fermentation that I really felt I am Buddhist, right, in the way that I observe how things are happening. And, you know, just saying, you know, small changes, but being observant of that. When you're making miso, you're, you're, it's a very mindful act, right? In that moment, you're only focusing on the task at hand. And I think that is a statement, right? That's something that has grounded me. And I think that's why I always go back to fermentation. Um, you know, just it's, it's really cathartic and really therapeutic on a daily, weekly, monthly basis to revisit the same exact thing and wonder and question and engage with it. 
you know, miso or sauerkraut or, or kombucha or tapache, and there's something really, um, really meaningful. Um, so I think, yes, there, 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 it, there is a statement with it. And I think um, depending on you know, where you are in life and kind of how you're viewing things, it can be grounding and actually, um, yeah, really grounding. I love that. Um, Maybe you three. Go on, Sandal. I think that, you know, it can be more than making a statement. I mean, I think it can really make change. And, and, and I think that, you know, basically the more people can sort of like walk away from the highly processed, overpackaged foods in the supermarket and do more of their food preparation from scratch whether it's fermented or, or, or otherwise, then you know, we're just basically reclaiming our food from these multinational corporations with very high profit margins um, that have gotten us used to thinking that we need them to pre-process our food for us. So uh, you know, I, mean, I think that fermentation is one part of a much larger process of reclaiming our food, um, which we need to do. Alyssa? Yeah, I think to me, um, as a woman, it's also a bit of a statement in that sense to reclaim this idea of a woman's places in the kitchen and kind of see that as a really um, beautiful way to empower yourself and your family through the act of fermentation. Um, partly as a historian as well, it's, it's not just preserving food, but it's preserving the time and the moment when that food was created. And in that sense, I completely echo um, you know, the kind of the spiritual elements of fermentation. Um, I remember very clearly as a child um, foraging for mushrooms with my grandfather and then, you know, cleaning them and putting them into jars and preserving them. That in itself was beautifully magical and very spiritual. And then opening that jar a few months later, not only you enjoy the amazing product that you have there, but you also kind of open up that memory and that moment in history that you've preserved in that jar. And now fermenting with my daughter as well, we've done lots of fermentation over Christmas and um, <laughs> some jars are still here, so maybe a bit, <laughs> a bit too long. I'm not sure if we're going to open them now. <laughs> <laughs> it's just having that jar and that again brings the memory of us doing something very meaningful, very fun. Um, and, you know, two women in the kitchen cooking, but not in the sense that we have to, but because we really want to, because we love it, and because we're preserving our family history through that jar. So to me, I definitely tick so many boxes in terms of making a, a statement with fermenting. Mm -hmm. James? Yeah, so definitely to echo what you're saying, Alyssa, and what you're saying, Kenji, about being kind of therapeutic. I've come to kind of see, and I think that as a keen gardener, you're going to appreciate this, uh, Leila. I, I see fermentation as like one part cooking um, because, you know, you're making and sharing food, which is always a lovely act. But you're also kind of, you're creating life, um, which is really exciting. Um, and with a sense of delayed gratification, you're, you're putting something in the jar that seems inert. And then you're coming back a little while later and you're going, oh, you know, like the kind of first buds appearing on like a tomato plant and knowing that there's going to be really something really tasty at the other end of things. As you start to see the first bubbles appear in like a jar of like sauerkraut or kimchi, you're like, okay, this is happening. There's going to be something brilliant uh, waiting for me here. And I brought that to life. That's exciting in a kind of therapeutic or Dr. Frankenstein way. Um, <laughs> but also is kind of a, a, a echoing um, Sandor in terms of uh, it being a kind of radical act. Um, Certainly as a child of the 80s, I was really kind of like raised within a culture that said you need to excoriate bacteria from every surface that you cook on. Uh, you need to remove every living thing from, from the kitchen. And it's kind of really dangerous and sexy that you're actually going, no, 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 no. We need <laughs> these microbes in our food, otherwise it won't work. You know, um, I and love I that you've just described microbes as sexy. Oh, <laughs> microbes are the sexiest. Sorry, my wife's there. Sorry. Um, no, I'm I'm all I'm all about that microbe wrangling. Absolutely, very sexy. Um, I think for me, one of the one of the reasons I love fermenting so much is I find it hugely empowering. That kind of and increasing that self-reliance and it's like I have just created this complex unique product very simply and easily from scratch 
and I've done it myself, especially when it's wine. I mean, like, seriously, the wine thing is really cool. It's like the coolest thing ever. But like, you know, people who like wine, you open wine, you're like, oh, lovely wine. When you open wine that you've made, and it was two years ago, and then you open it, you're like, I just made this. How freaking cool is that? And whenever, and even if it's just like a two week lacto ferment thing, I'm just like, I made this. And then also, I love the act of giving yourself a future gift. Because it's like, lucky two weeks time me, or <laughs> lucky eight months from now me. And it's like gifting yourself a present into the future. So that's, that's my answer. Um, the next question I wanted to ask is, so whenever I chat to friends or family members and I'm extolling the virtues of fermentation, often to people who have some kind of gut issue, because that seems to be so prevalent these days, so, so many people have such troubles with their digestive systems, and I've, I've got one family member in, in mind, and I say to her, you know, fermented food, she goes, yeah, I keep hearing about fermented foods, I know I'm supposed to eat more of them, I want to eat more of them, there are so many of them, and I don't really know where to start, I'm overwhelmed by it all, which one should I have? How many different ones am I supposed to have? How much of each thing am I supposed to eat? How do you incorporate these really weird, funky things into like general daily eating? So my question is, do you have any advice for people who very much want to eat more fermented foods because they know it will do them good, but they just don't really know where to start? Anyone want to go first? Sure. Um, um, yeah, I mean, I would say lean into what you like, right? I think, you know, I'm sure everyone here has had a fermented ingredient. Um, and I think don't complicate it, right? Because I think while, yes, there are many elements of fermentation that are very complex and do require a lot of, you know, failures and a lot of successes. But I think if you want to learn the basics of, you know, say sauerkraut or, of, you know, kombucha or, you know, a lot of things, to be honest. It's just following some basic principles, basic rules. You know, there is some math involved, but beyond that, as long as you follow some best practices, um, anything from you know measuring salt to you know ensuring things are below the brine, things will be things will be okay, right? And I think the important thing to remember is that these microbes want to survive, right? So if you do create the right environment for them, they will find a way, right? Very Jurassic Park, but um, <laughs> so um, yeah. So that'd be my advice, right? Just find what you like. Lean into that. And again, you know, with sauerkraut, case in point, right, or even kimchi, a lot of these ingredients don't need to be expensive, right? So if you mess it up, what's the worst that'll happen? You throw it out, right? But then you try and try again. And that's what I always tell people when I teach workshops, when, I, when I'm talking to people, that find what you like and just experiment, but follow these processes. Um, mm. so yeah. I'm going to go back this way, James. Sure. Um, so to try and give a super practical answer, um, going through kind of like the chapters in my book, I'd kind of think of a, like a, a flight. If you're making fermented foods from like the simplest, start with tapache. It's really, really easy. Like literally get some pineapple, eat the pineapple, get the skin and the core, put it in a jar, add some sugar water, a uh, bit of cinnamon, leave it jarred up for like five, seven days, depending on how, how hot it is where you are. Done. Kefir. Even easier, get some kefir grains, get some milk, put them together, leave it for eight hours, go to work, come back, strain it, done. If you're feeling confident after that, like sauerkrauts, kimchi are not much harder, um, then maybe kombucha, and then look, you're obviously getting quite advanced, maybe just jump into some koji and make some soy sauce. What, it's gonna take like nine months, no problem. Um, but yeah, as Kenji says, you've just got to do, take one of those that you love and that you'll enjoy and then make it. And also, yeah, don't be afraid to fail. Like I think a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know how, how I'll know if it goes wrong. Like very, very few of if anything that I've made goes wrong when I ferment it. But when it does, you super, super, super know. <laughs> There's no like, oh, I wonder. It's a little bit like off milk. We've got like a deep lizard brain thing. We're like, oh no, I'm not eating that. <laughs> like. So you will know, so don't worry. Just get in there and start fermenting. Alyssa. Well, also, I think, as Sandra was saying, that um, we kind of need to expand our understanding of fermentation because, you know, as soon as, someone, as soon as someone says fermentation, you kind of think of this obscure thing in a jar with bubbles and making weird sounds and smells coming out of it. But actually, we eat fermented food all the time. You know, yogurt, cheese, Breads. I mean, everyone eats it daily, and no one asks, oh, how much should I have of that? Mm. 
Um, so I think it's just kind of removing that uh, kind of veil of mystery <laughs> away from the concept of fermentation. And equally, you know, obviously there's so much health advice, but, you know, trust your body, do a bit of intuitivity, mm. try something, see how you feel. If you know, I'm sadly one of those people, and I can't believe I'm saying this out loud, but I can't eat too many ferments because my stomach just can't <laughs> deal with it, sadly. Um, so, you know, I take it a bit at a time and then sometimes over a few weeks I actually feel absolutely fine. I can feel like I can eat a lot more than usual and other weeks I feel like I need to stay away from it. So I think it's really trusting and knowing your own body and um, there are so many amazing books <laughs> around that will guide you through the most basic steps to take to start fermenting and then just trust your senses. We've been eating fermented food since you know, the dawn of days, so it's part of our DNA. Sandal? Well, yeah, I mean, the first bit of advice I would offer is um, there's no need to eat large portions. Uh, I would say eating with frequency is more important than large portions if you're, you know, sort of trying to improve your digestion. And, um, you know, all the time I meet people who feel like they don't know how to eat sauerkraut. And I would say, think about sauerkraut and other forms of fermented vegetables as a condiment. And, um, you know, they make a sandwich juicy. You can just add them on as a, as, as a, you know, onto a sandwich. You can use them as a side dish with, with almost anything. Um, and the, then the other thing is, I mean, although sauerkraut classically is cabbage, you can use the same dry salting technique with virtually any vegetable. So if you don't like cabbages, but you love celery, you can make a beautiful celery kraut. You can make a beautiful cabbage kraut. You can work with beetroots. You can work with turnips, parsnips, what, whatever kinds of vegetables you, know, you get most excited about, you can ferment them. Um, and so, you know, think of it as a realm where you can, you know, play and experiment and, and you know, work out what you like. And, and even within a singular ingredient, um, you can season it in different ways. And then the ultimate variable in fermentation is time. You know, you can ferment your vegetables for five days. You can ferment your vegetables for five weeks. And they're going to have a much stronger flavor after five weeks. And, you know, if you're thinking about probiotics, actually the composition of the community is going to shift over time. So you could eat it, you know, a little bit every week over the course of five weeks, and you'll be eating something that's a little bit different. I find what I do is uh, with most meals, I will just have some pickles with it, like anything, pasta, carbonara, just a few pickled carrots on the side. Uh, it's, it, I mean, pickles go with everything. And also the first thing I fermented was just carrots because we've always got carrots in the fridge and I just put them in a jar and I add this salt water and I wait two weeks and they were like, how, do, how can carrots be this delicious? And, th and that was it. So if anyone, so that would be my advice. Just start with a quite common ingredient that you often have and stick it in some salt water and then uh, try it after two weeks. Um, this time has gone so quickly. Wow. I want to ask you a fun question. Not that these weren't fun, they were all fun. But what I want to ask you is, what is the most obscure thing that you have fermented yourselves or the most obscure fermented thing that you have sampled? I'm going to start with Alyssa. Um, mine isn't that exciting, or maybe it will be later on, but um, I think the most bizarre thing I've ever made uh, started off as the most classic uh, family favourite recipe of uh, fermented cucumbers. Um, because I, I love them and it's my mom's kind of signature recipe that's done rounds through friends and family and everyone loves it. Um, it completely foolproof, I've made it. And then I, we were moving house and I sort of, that jar kind of got lost somewhere at the back of some box. And it's now been two years. <laughs> it's still sitting somewhere in my garden and I'm <laughs> terrified of even coming near it. <laughs> but maybe one day, <laughs> when I do, it might be suddenly my fermenting disaster will turn into like the biggest success ever. <laughs> but it hasn't exploded. No, I, it's probably just died by now. Okay. <laughs> oh my God. If, if you... I kind of check on it to see if like it grew legs and already like walked away to the neighbor's garden, but it's still there and I'm yet to discover what's inside. If you ever crack it open, you need to tell me how that went <laughs> and take photographic evidence. Uh, Kenji. 
Um, okay, so I, I make a lot of miso. I make miso at a lot of different things. Um, and one, so I'm, I'm also not really a baker. So I made a chocolate cake once, um, which without following a recipe, which I wouldn't recommend. Um, and it wasn't <laughs> particularly good, but then I quickly thought, oh, let's turn it into a miso. Um, so again, it was just a kind of a mediocre chocolate cake. I added salt, I added rice koji that I had recently made, um, and I forgot about it. And that was probably a year and a half ago. And actually, last week with Miles, I tried some, um, and it is incredible. Um, <laughs> who would have thought, right? Salt, soybean, or salt, um, rice koji, and chocolate cake. Yeah, it's, um, it's very cheesy in a, in a pleasant way. Um, um, it also, it's, um, it's very berry-like. It's actually quite fruity. So whatever, I think there's maybe cinnamon in the original recipe, so that's really come through in a, in a very floral way, actually. Um, don't really know what I'm gonna do with it yet, but. Um, you didn't bring it. I did not bring it. That is no. not in the I, I wouldn't, no, I wouldn't, no, you wouldn't try that. <laughs> it, 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 it is weird, objectively, but um, it's really interesting, and again, the magic of koji. Right. And could you just explain how, how one makes a miso? Sure, so at a very basic level, so there's essentially three elements. So number one, traditionally it's soybeans. So soybeans are steamed, um, or rather they're boiled actually. They're, you, know, you, you want to be able to squash them. That's ingredient number one. Ingredient number two is salt. And ingredient number three is rice koji, which is, is what traditionally is used. So it's koji that's been inoculated with a specific um, koji um, culture which again has been cultivated in Japan for a very long time. And koji is? Koji is um, Aspergillus oryzae. Okay. Yes. So koji is the name of the... <laughs> oh, sorry. Koji is the name of essentially the, 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 the fungi, the culture, that's used to create miso, soy sauce, uh, mirin, uh, so like mirin, um, vinegars, etc. So again, that's kind of a sake, the building block, again, of a lot of Japanese ingredients. So when I, when I see people such as this group over here saying they've made miso from really funky weird things. Is it basically they've replaced the soybeans with something else such as chocolate cake? Pretty much, yeah. So you can, you can, you can, um, <laughs> you can follow the same methodology, right? Um, and also you can grow koji itself on different substrates, which is quite cool. So traditionally it's grown on rice, but you can grow it on soybeans, you can grow it on vegetables, you can grow it on um, oatmeal, on oats. So, um, and this is why, going back to, you know, this is why it's so exciting. There's so many creative, new, innovative ways that you can bring these traditions and these methods together. Um, but yeah, so. That is a pretty good answer to that question. Uh, ooh, Sandor, I feel like you're gonna have a good one. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, my underlying faith is that like there's nothing we could possibly eat that cannot be fermented in any number of ways. So, you know, so I'm never surprised, although, um, um, you know, certainly I've, I've tasted some, you know, far out koji concoctions. The last time I was in the UK, I had sausage roll miso. Um, uh, but, you know, you can turn almost anything uh, uh, into miso and koji will break anything down like, oh my God, you know, like, you know, sort of in the, uh, my computer is sitting on you haven't a fermented that, full have of you? soy sauce <laughs> that, um, that, 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 that's been fermenting for over a year now. But taking that idea of koji and salt and some proteinaceous substance, um, you know, chefs around the world are, are really playing with what that proteinaceous substance is. And when I was uh, in Australia a few years ago, I had um, um, an, an emu uh, 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 concoction that was fermented with, with, with koji, but like, but almost, almost anything. I wanna just talk about sort of something that I just had when I was in Brazil and I had a few years ago when I was in Colombia, that's an Amazon ferment. So I already talked about cassava and the fermentation of cassava, but um, you, you know, one of the strategies people in the Amazon use for cassava is they grate it and then they wring it out. And the juice is where the toxin is uh, concentrated. So then they can go ahead and use the fibrous parts of the plant um, but then they ferment the juice and often they'll cook down the juice. Uh, and there's this Amazon uh, condiment called tukupi that's a tar-like reduction of the fermented, uh, previously toxic juice of the cassava. So that's really delicious. And when I first encountered it, that was very unexpected. Wow. Um, James. Uh, so kind of... Um, 
leaning back to, to, to both Kenji and Sandor's answers in terms of like fermenting things with koji, koji is definitely the secret to a lot of freaky ferments. Um, and I think I know the person who probably made the, uh, the miso that Sandor tried, the, 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 the sostrol miso. He's a <laughs> member of the, the Fermenters Guild. Uh, I think there's a few members in, in what, that row there who will put their hands up being like, yeah, we ferment a lot of shit. Um, <laughs> and he's also fermented, and I've got in my fridge some, his fermented uh, miso Haribo. So I've got <laughs> Haribo miso, which I like springing out when like, I have dinner guests around being like, you'll never guess what this is. And no one ever does. So it's very exciting. Um, but in terms of like the weirdest thing I've probably fermented myself is, and this is, yeah, kind of, is this book, which I wrote, um, which I've, uh, I don't know if you can see it, I'll, I'll show it outside, um, which I uh, got, the way that you make kombucha is you make a kind of, you, it, a byproduct of it is it creates like a pellicle, a mother, um, which is a kind of uh, gelatinous kind of substance, which when you dry out, it turns into something like a leather. Um, so in the kind of sleep deprived, crazed uh, moments, uh, just after I, 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 this book came out, and a bookshop asked me, could you ferment a copy of a book, which I think was meant as a throwaway kind of comment. And I was like, mm, yes, I'll try. So I got some of a friend's um, uh, uh, kombucha, Lou from Twisted Kombucha gave me a huge piece of kombucha uh, scoby. And I dried that out for a few weeks in my office. Um, and then I set about teaching myself how to bind a book. And I, I got the kind of like dried out like leather-like substance. I covered it in glue and I bound uh, this book in it and then I printed the lovely illustrations by Maria Tiorina uh, on the front. So I suppose I sort of fermented my book. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> you got to pass that round in the things so that we, we can have a look at that. Um, on the note of fermenting cookbooks, we are now going to open it up to the audience. So please, audience, and also people tuning on online. I think there's a hell of a lot of you online as well. We will also be taking online questions. But anyone here, do we have a question? We do. Over there. Um, this goes back to... Uh, oh, I don't think he needs one. <laughs> 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 um, Pat, um, this goes back to your... Sauerkraut, how can people look out for the real stuff versus the stuff that's pretending to be the real stuff? Um, it's, it's, it's not easy. I was actually having a chat with Tim Spector last week, and he was like, I've got this jar in my fridge, and I can't, how, I, I don't know how to tell whether it's proper sauerkraut or not. And I won't name them, but I looked at the brand, and I was like, yeah, it's not. I know it isn't. Because <laughs> um, I know how much it costs, and it's too cheap. Um, <laughs> But I think really it's kind of a tricky one where it's often inverse indicators, where you'll be looking for, pe for people writing unpasteurized or looking for people writing raw. Um, and then you're also, I suppose, you're looking to not have ingredients like vinegar in, say, lacto ferments generally. Um, that would be an indication that they haven't usually been properly fermented. Um, it's a bit tricky because there is an EU guidance which says that you can't market products uh, at Generally, it's very difficult to market food products as probiotic, which is, I think, what a lot of commercial producers are trying to get at, saying that they're, 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 their ferments are probiotic. But that infers that there's a health benefit, so you're not allowed to say that. So you're kind of looking for uh, kind of bywords for that. Um, so yeah, as I say, uh, raw, unpasteurized, living, all that kind of thing. And then probably not, although I was kind of debating this with Tim, like he was like, if it has a two-year shelf life on it, is that definitely not like good fermented food? And I'm like, ah. to be honest, I've kept my own kimchi, which I only have like a five, six month shelf life on. I've kept that for like two years and it's fine. But I wouldn't say that like commercially because it's definitely a really different product at the end of two years. But it's not inedible. It's just really, 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 really sour. And it's kind of going to have broken down. Um, but yeah, so I don't think you can even take shelf life as it. It's, it's not easy. I'm going to, I promise. Mr. Spectre, uh, Professor Spectre, rather, sorry. Uh, I put my uh, thinking cap on about it, though. But yeah, raw, unpasteurized, living, those kind of words are all good ones to look out for. Sander, were you raising your hand? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the one thing I would add to that is the place where you're going to find the live fermented vegetables 
is in a refrigerator mm. because as a, you know, not, not that you couldn't leave them outside of refrigeration for, for a limited period of time, but as a practical matter, if they're going to sit for weeks in a supermarket, they're going to build up pressure if they're not in a refrigerator. And then, you know, the juice from them will start oozing down the edges of the jar and make the label illegible. So, I mean, it's just, you know, the pasteurized products typically are in an unrefrigerated section, which is part of what keeps them so cheap. Um, and the raw products typically you're going to find in a refrigerated section. And of course, the old world way of doing it was to sort of serve the sauerkraut or the pickles right out of the barrel in which they were fermented at the point of sale. But very few people are doing that anymore. So look for words like raw, unpasteurized, and check out the fridge aisle. Okay. Any more questions? Let us go, yes, over there, thank you. Hi, um, my name is Dasha and I'm a budding food anthropologist. Um, I, I started exploring for, with fermentation when I researched edible insects in India. Um, and I, I sort of played with koji while fermenting ants and crickets. I tried to make a cricket miso and an uh, ant chutney. Amazing. And suffice to say, I've never done this before. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> I've never done this before, and there certainly wasn't any recipe book or... Uh, well, I, I did look at Noma for how to make a miso. Um, I did refer... I, I actually know Dolly Kiko and that, that Sando included in his new uh, book who gave me the idea for the ants. Um, but there wasn't really a, a recipe for me to follow. So I guess I'm just asking for any advice on how to sort of train the intuitive side of, of being a fermenter versus a cook who could just have, who almost has the luxury of being able to open up to a cookbook and follow a recipe step by step. Because um, a lot of the advice I got was, you know, if it smells good to you, it's, it's, it's good. But I often I found myself asking, can I trust myself? Mm. Um, that is a good question. That is a good question. So, so yes, because fermenting it and it changes every time, depending on time of year, season of the veg or whatever. So how can you train yourself to be more intuitive when it comes to fermenting and rely on your senses more? I think that's a really good and really hard question, actually. I think it really takes practice. And I know that's not really a helpful answer. But in the sense of, you know, like the first few, the first time I ever made sauerkraut, I was like, oh my god, there's camsies. I threw it away. Obviously, I now know that's not bad, and there's ways to get over that and to resolve the that. Which ones? Camsies. So that's. Oh, like, sorry, I, sorry, I pronounced my, it. My yeah, yeah. Accent, sorry, mm. camsies. But yeah, that's a very common um, use that can happen. But I would say, you know, with miso making, which I think, you know, you know, you're, you're going to wait six to nine plus months, right, to see if it's done. I think, you know, just you just, <laughs> which is not a great answer. But I think you just need to practice, right? Do several batches, see what works. Um, also, like, get your friends involved, and like, you know, especially if you have other friends who are into fermentation, who might, you know, just be able to sense check your your thinking. Um, just because I think, you know, unless you have a community of that, or if you grew up with some of these, what things should taste like, it's really hard to, hard to know. Um, and I think, you know, there's there's been many ferments that I have thrown away because you know they either went bad or I just didn't trust myself until with practice and again following the rules or what cookbooks might say. Um, and then just going with it, or, or moving it to the fridge just to keep it a bit more stable, and then just letting it sit there and kind of fester, for better or for worse. <laughs> Sandals raised his hand. Yeah, I mean, I mean that that that's a great question, and I agree with what Kenji said that you know it's a process that takes time. I mean, first of all, don't imagine that fermentation is dangerous. I mean, you know, fermentation is a strategy for safety. Um, ab above all else. And generally, fermenting any food will make it safer than it started out being. Um, so, so don't like project additional anxiety onto the idea of fermentation. But of course, you know, when something is ready is not necessarily a clear objective moment. There's, there's, there's frequently a, 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 like a subjective aspect of that. And if we, you know, I think cheese illustrates this so well, where, you know, um, you know, I, I mean, almost everybody loves, you know, some kind of cheese, but, you know, most of us could recount some cheese that the smell of it 
or the flavor of it was just like too strong and just we couldn't we, we you know we, we we just couldn't wrap ourselves around it and um you know but clearly somebody loves it and um you know and and i would say over the course of my life like the cheeses that get me really excited now you know as as a kid i would just be horrified at like watching myself eat them and 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 you know like i, I think of a lot of the byproducts of fermentation as sort of edgy and, um, you know, some ferments, if you let them go for longer and longer times, let's say the, the, the group of people who will accept the flavor might narrow, but <laughs> the excitement that the people who can really um, um, embrace the stronger flavor, um, um, you know, the intensity of their um, um, uh, 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 um, desire for it, their pleasure from it, you know, is, is unparalleled. So, you know, training yourself to the smells and, and flavors of fermentation, I, I mean, it's important to, to be able to have a sense of when it has gone awry, but sometimes even when the process is going perfectly, when it goes on for long enough, it creates flavors that might be kind of edgy and controversial. It's a good way to figure out who your true friends are. <laughs> Who's going to sample this thing that probably went too far a few weeks ago? Um, questions. There was one over. Yes, this gentleman down here. I do a lot of um, <coughs> brewing uh, beer. Um, as you all know, that's driven by yeast. Um, if you infect that with bacteria, you get sour beer. Now, are there any bacteria that will give you a beer that isn't sour, with the right alcohol content, of course. Who is the beer brewer amongst us? Sandal, do you have beer, beer background? Do you like beer? Well, I mean, I've, I've, I've dabbled in, in beer brewing and, I, you know, I mean, my perspective on sour beer is like, I love sour beer and I believe until the end of the 19th century, when um, pure yeast became available, pretty much all beer that people drank was to some degree or another sour beer. Now, I mean, certainly there are all kinds of bacteria that, you know, don't produce acidic byproducts. I mean, you know, one of the most common soil bacteria is Bacillus subtilis, uh, which is the bacteria that gives us uh, natto and um, all of these uh, uh, delicious West African seasonings, dawa dawa, iru. Um, so Bacillus subtilis, which produces alkaline byproducts, is everywhere, and I don't know that you would want Bacillus subtilis in your beer. Um, it's probably there anyway, because it's probably on the barley that you're starting with, um, and it can survive boiling temperatures. Um, but um, you know, I would just wouldn't assume that all bacteria are, um, you know, contributing acidity because, you know, lots and lots of them produce other kinds of byproducts. Let's take one from online. Yes. So we have uh, Julianne in Kansas. Uh, Julianne in Kansas says, the ancient Romans relied on garum, a fermented fish sauce. When my husband was teaching this to his Latin students, a light bulb seemed to go off for a student of Korean heritage. And right before Christmas, a student gifted my husband a jar of his father's homemade kimchi. It was amazing. And so the question is, have you ever experienced similar situations where fermented foods have bridged cultures? Nice. Sandor is nodding. But, does any, but, but just in case, anyone else? Because Sandor, <laughs> Sandor's great at answering it. <laughs> no? OK, Sandor, go, take it away. Sure. I mean, I think, you know, fermentation bridges all kinds of um, uh, uh, cultures. And what, one of the most fun presentations I ever made was um, in Vancouver, British Columbia, at the University of British Columbia. I was there doing different events for a week, and they invited me to make a presentation to a group of newly arrived foreign students who were having like a, from non-English speaking places. So it was, you know, a chance for them to, you know, improve their, their uh, uh, language skills. 
And, you know, once I started talking about fermentation, like, you know, everybody had examples of fermentation and, you know, people who were nervous about speaking in English, like wanted to talk about the foods of the places they came from. And it ended up being a just really like beautiful exchange with students from different continents, like realizing they have had something in common, even though the specific foods that they were fermenting were uh, uh, so different. So, I mean, I think fermentation is just like a brilliant, terrain for, you know, cross-cultural um, communications and bridge building. There is time for one question. Ooh, now all the hands are going up. Uh, before we have the <laughs> tasting, I'm going to go to the back over here, this lady. Hi, it's, oh, it's Yelena. I'm originally from Serbia and I actually have a a message for Lisa, really, because I've been touched by your moving cucumber jar. It made me, made really my heart resonate with it on a different level. When I think about when my grandmother passed away, behind her in her pantry were left different fruit preserved jars, um, fermented cucumbers and fermented tomatoes. It's been over 10 years since she passed away. And my mother keeps adding to this pantry and we keep eating that, but those are the jars that nobody touches and lovingly looks at. And it makes me think often when I spend my time in this part of Serbia, now taking my children there um, and telling them stories about it because my granny was called Strawberry, Jagoda in Serbian, <laughs> that was her name. Um, how much comfort in the first months of my grandmother passing those jars gave to my mother? how we attach emotions, not just for the, to the flavor, but to just these materialistic objects that almost are able to uh, preserve the soul of somebody who is no longer materially present with us, but it's still there, the recipe is still there. And I do wonder how long we're going to keep these jars for. And makes me think of your jar. If, if your move to another flat was so important and you made these cucumbers with your daughter, every time you move, you could make another jar. <laughs> and then when she moves out for uni, you can give her all those jars. <laughs> I love that. Thank you. Um, and on that note, I think we, we have a round of applause for the questions. And <laughs> But really, to all four of you, that was so great. Your answers were brilliant and so interesting and so nuanced. And I got so much out of that. And I hope everyone else did as well. So thank you, all four of you, so much. You were, like, brilliant. Uh, Sandor, sorry, you cannot taste the tapache and the oh, beautiful ferment. I'm so disappointed. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. Also, your kitchen looks awesome. There is so much going on. <laughs> and I have things that I'll be tasting. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Sandor. Enjoy yourself. Everyone, thank you so much for coming. And as, so as we mentioned, please do stay for the tasting and we'll be floating around and happy to have a talk as well. Thank you. Thank you.